pillars of any metagame. You know, this is classically, Mike Flores would talk about this all the time. You have aggro, you have control, and you have combo. Yes. It seems to me like control, very well represented in Legacy. Um, like with these Lee of Old decks. Any deck with Lee of Old is a control deck? Is that kind of true? Well, it's kind of true, except that whole wheel structure really gets smashed by how effective the threats are and okay. how kind of easy it is to add in control elements. Oh, so, so, so there's no true control deck is what the, you're saying? I would say Miracles in certain builds was a true control deck, uh, and those lists tended to go to time, and they had very few answers. But what we saw, even toward the end with Miracles, is people playing a four mentor build, oh. which started to change kind of the, the dynamic, where yes, it was a control deck, but it also had the ability to just combo out with a sensei's top and a mentor, where you could just get out a mentor, get a few guys, and then just switch your tops a few right, times right. and just close out the game. Oh, boy. So, yeah, it, it really does, the lines are blurred, and the decks that tend to succeed the most are the decks that are able to play multiple roles at the same time. Okay. So, you know, when you're able to go combo or aggro with a combo finish. Like elves say, right? Yeah, exactly, where you're, you're going aggro and then you turn the corner, uh -huh. shields are down, you just kill them. Uh, control decks that can do the same. Uh, it's really the depth of the card pool just lets you play more than one role at a time. I see. And the, the trickiness of the format is making sure that that is successful because if you do try and play more roles than you're able to, if you try and play control in a matchup where you're supposed to be the beat down, I know that, how that is ends. where you just lose. Yeah. Uh, but it is very possible for a deck to play multiple roles at once given the strength of cards like Brainstorm uh, and the card advantage that can come out of this format. Yeah. The one ofs in Legacy are unlike the one ofs of any other format, right? Like the one ofs in Standard, it's a crapshoot. You draw it or you don't. The one ofs in Modern, a little less so. You have Serum Visions. Um, but the one ofs in Legacy, you can just draw those so easily with cards like Brainstorm. All right, so what do we have here? We have three deck lists, and unless they change the format of this tournament, I think it's still one on one. So we're going to find out which of the two we're going to use. Uh, and I hope it's Josh Sissio, because this is a name I recognize from way back. He's been playing a long time. Um, I don't know if he plays at Scholars. He does come out for our bigger events. Yeah, I've played with Josh back at Over the Edge in Worcester oh, wow. uh, back in the day. That is old school, that, man. That was a great tournament scene there for a number of years. Uh, Josh and Brent were there pretty much every week, and uh, they've very often been playing similar lists uh, since then. And yeah, I, I would very much like to see that. Baleful Strix, a card that has the new card frames, so you'd think it'd be legal and modern, but first printed in a supplemental set, only legal and legacy, and I think it'd be too good for modern, to be honest. It's just so efficient. It's just too efficient, in my opinion. The fact that it's a four of and a lot of legacy decks shows you how powerful that card is. Yeah, oh, it would certainly disrupt modern. Uh, it's difficult for a 1-1 one, one to really take over the format, <laughs> sure, which is sure. the, the upside. Uh, and it's also difficult mana. Much more difficult mana in modern than it is in legacy. Two mana in legacy is like you're not even trying. Uh, whereas modern is a little bit tougher to get that. But I agree, it is a very powerful effect, and it really changes the, the matchup of, of a lot of decks. Uh, even if you're abrupt decaying it, you don't feel good. Like they drew no, a card. It's a uh, guaranteed so, two for one. Yeah, it, it really is. It really is difficult. Bouncing it with Jace is also not acceptable. Uh, so really, you're you're looking at like spell snaring it, and okay. you know spell snares not really in there for that. You know, spell snares usually in there for for cards that are more back breaking. Uh, a card like counterbalance or in the Torak, maybe. Yeah, things that are really brutal. Uh, but I mean, if you've got it you'll throw it at it, because it, it really is going to trade with, with something eventually. Sure, sure. Now, Baleful Strix's best friend, Shardless Agent, uh, we used to see a lot. Yes. Right, now what, what happened? Was was it only Leovold's printing? Is that... I mean, that is one element of it. Uh, Leovold is always going to do what he says he's going to do, and Shardless Agent is sometimes a game winner, and sometimes actually just an overcosted tutu. There are plenty of times where you are ahead on board and you try and seal the deal with the shardless and you just hit like an abrupt decay oh. with, with no target. Uh, so that's very underwhelming. Hitting a brainstorm off of it is not really great either. Uh, you know, usually brainstorm is the type of card that you're going to be wanting to set up and you know you're tapped out a lot of the time when you cast them so you're going to brainstorm like draw one card yeah kind you, of. you put yeah. two back on top it, it really doesn't do much maybe you get a chance to, to fetch away one land uh, one card uh, but it's a very suboptimal use of brainstorm uh, so yeah we've got josh and a 
uh, Robert playing a Grixis control. Okay, that's pretty cool. Like, so more of a Grixis control deck rather than the Delver strategy we saw last round. He has a true name, Gurmag, still, but backs it up with Baleful. Uh, and more counter spells. The card itself counter spells. So this this will maybe be a slower match. Yeah, this is very close to a mirror, uh, in the sense that they both have similar threats, similar answers. Uh, this type of match very often comes down to variance and play skill. If you, if you can draw some of your cards that are amazing in the matchup, that can be tough to overcome. Uh, but just solid play throughout can really make the difference. That's the kind of magic I love to see. Magic where solid play is rewarded. And here we go, Underground Sea versus Underground Sea, Deathrite Shaman versus Deathrite Shaman. How do these matches usually go? Well, I'd, I'd have to give the edge to the foil Deathrite, ah. but it's still too early to tell. Yeah, this is, a lot of the time, one player will have to take the role of playing defense based off of what their opponent's hand looks like. So if Josh senses that Robert's going to need that death right to develop his mana, he can keep it back to be able to hit those lands in response because it's whoever's activation resolves is the one that's going to get the effect. Right. So your death right is essentially going to play defense. If they target a land, you go ahead and target it. Uh, if they go to target an instant or sorcery, you, you can follow suit. It's just a question of whether or not you let that happen during your end step, freeing up their mana. So there's, there's a little sub game going on right now, depending on how the mana development goes. And as we see, it looks like Robert hit his third land there. So denying the mana may become less relevant. Yep. Important to note also, Josh did mull the six, so he starts at a bit of a disadvantage. But as the game goes on, that'll matter less and less. Death right getting in that two damage there. Knight's Whisper already doing two to him, so a little bit of a, a push toward the, the mid game there. But we're still very early in terms of board development. And really, Death Right Shaman makes it difficult to stabilize. The longer, grindier games, you can start to get creatures into the graveyard. You can start to pull back away from the, the brink and just kind of stabilize there as well. The card just does a lot. Here we're seeing Brainstorm, Fetch Land. Josh really making sure what he puts on top, he's going to want to kiss goodbye. Yeah, you got to figure the Polluted Delta is coming out right afterward to shuffle. And uh, I actually see a Thoughtseize in Josh's hand. This will be good. It'll both let him know what's in uh, his opponent's hand and, uh, just as importantly, let us know. So I want to see it. Josh has assembled a, a wide variety of colors there. He's uh, got all four plus the death right, so mana should not be an issue for him. Here's the Thoughtseize. Always powerful in Magic. Uh, Fifth Dawn All-Star Knight's Whisper. Let's, uh, let's the user save on mana. Lorwyn All-Star Thoughtseize. Let's the user save on mana. Basically trading mana for life points. Uh, very powerful in a format where the mana is constrained like Legacy. Like, now it's, it's worth noting that Blood Moon is in Robert's sideboard, and the way that Josh has fetched out his lands here, it is a massive threat. He, you know, if you have your basics in play and Death Rite, you can usually function, uh, but that Death Rite will pretty rapidly run out of basic of lands in the graveyard in order to create other colors, and that. Opposing death right would eventually just go on defense leaving Josh with just red mana for the rest of the game So we need to be on the lookout for that This is a decision. He's got force blue cards. It looks like snapcaster brainstorm and a fatal push along with some lands We got a pair down. Yeah, this is a pair down. Uh, okay. Just confirming that Josh is 2 0 while Rob is 1 1. 
So it looks like the Kolyans was taken with uh, the Thoughtseize. Yep. So that earlier Blood Moon comment, we'll have to wait for games two and three. We imagine that Josh knows that there's no Blood Moon in the main deck and he's just going to be able to fearlessly fetch out and possibly bait Robert into bringing it in. It's not the best in this matchup. It's certainly not as powerful as, say, versus lands. Uh, but if you're unprepared for it, it will shut you down. Yeah, Blood Moon, one of these cards that uh, is printed very early in Magic and just gets better and better and better as the more lands are printed, the better non-basic lands are printed. Yeah, and Modern has really done a ton to kind of buoy the value of that card. I remember, I mean, it was it was just a couple dollars for a very long time. It was not really the best legacy card, and I think, again, Modern kind of showed us the way there. Right. Where the amount of brain power that goes into the format and, you know, really finding a way to make Blood Moon work, finding the shells that it functions in. And uh, it's it's been it's been a player in Legacy for quite a few years now, and everybody needs to be prepared for it. So Robert now has Death Ray advantage. I got to imagine it's in Josh's best interest to remove that ASAP. Yeah, the the long grindy games of of just draw go and in, in a control matchup are are kind of dead. Death Ray Shaman does mean that if you don't answer it, the game will be over. You know, similar to Delver in that way, but you know, so much more to the table in the sense that it's mana acceleration and it can disrupt your opponent. Not quite as much damage, but well worth the trade-off. Oh, and this is a pretty good answer to Death Rite Shaman. Coligon's command saying two damage. And uh, perhaps discard a card, perhaps recur the death right. We'll get our table judge to let us know. Or we'll just see it when it resolves. Judging from this, it looks like it's not going to matter because it's getting forced. Yep, so uh, two cards down for Robert, one life point down. He probably could have picked the, the mode with a D6. Uh, any <laughs> one of those would have been good. That's true. Uh, it, it is a really powerful card. And that's that's a nice new printing that's really changed things. Snapcaster and Coldman's Command is Oof. is just such a value play. You know, you're you're just getting so much out of it that it's uh, it's hard not to, you know, even smile if your opponent gets that. <laughs> it's like, all right. That's, Another card just guaranteed two for one. Yeah. Almost definitely. So yeah, the modes on it were Kill Shaman and also Get Back Shaman. So that's what baited out the Force of Will. So it looks like we've got a Snapcaster and a Death Rite on the side of Robert. And he's trying to build Snapcaster Supremacy, really lock it in. Yep, Robert's plan going long just has to be Coligon Snapcaster while using his Death Rites to fight over Josh's Coligon Snapcaster. Josh's graveyard will not be sticking around very long. Are these decks as graveyard-centric as they look, or is this just kind of an anomalous game? I mean, Death Rite does shift the focus to both on the board and the graveyard. Uh, there's there's no getting around that. The two life at a clip does really matter, uh, but these are decks that can function without it. Okay. You know, a card like Rest in Peace is not always going to come in. It really depends on the rest of the mix. You know, it's good versus cards like Gurmag Angler. Uh, it makes it merely unplayable. But, hmm. you know, if they have Tarmogoyfs, that starts to become a little bit more interesting. If they're on True Name Nemesis, a little bit less so. Right. I, they really are... The added value, like, you're only shutting off half of their card with a card like Rest in Peace. So, yeah, Snapcaster is just an Ambush Viper, but it's still an Ambush yeah, Viper. Yeah, that's still not bad. You know what I mean? Like, it's... It's, it's still something, so it's not a complete brick, and, and that's the, the challenge, is getting the most utility. There's a Baleful Strix uh, drawing card, which is a polluted delta, so he's still on the Snapcaster, and they are... Uh, the Snapcaster is going to be able to do kind of whatever he needs it to as he gets more mana. Yeah, hell, I mean, if he, if he plays that fetch land, he can even snap hardcast force of them. Absolutely. Which, against two cards in hand, no permanents on board, that is an attractive line. Rob kind of putting the ball in Josh's court here. He says, okay, eventually you are going to die to these two motley creatures. Um, 
which really adds the value of Snapcaster. Snapcaster, a really good reactive card. So Death Rite probably wants to get rid of Diabolic Edict as soon as possible. Hmm. Print the flashback. Yeah, you really don't want your opponent to be able to Snapcaster in response, and that's exactly what's going to happen. Ouch. The, the opening was there, so now that Diabolic Edict is going to get full value, and he gets the Snapcaster on board. So, Baleful Strix down for the count. Yep. Tassiger is a strong draw here. I think that might be a different Delve card. I think that's a Murderous cut. Or am I wrong here? Oh, it might be. Yeah, Murder Cat. It always looks like Murder Cat to me. <laughs> Murder Cat. With the new, <laughs> with the new uh, font. Yeah. That should absolutely be a magic card. Yeah, I think it'd be a good altar. Destroy target cat. Delve. So here we have a 2-1 with no abilities facing off against a 1-2 with so many abilities. Three cards in hand versus one card in hand. You gotta put Robert's chances in this match pretty high. Pretty high. The question for him is can he win with enough time left on the clock? And he's going for Snapcaster. Oh yeah, here's the combo. Snapcaster Coligans. Probably getting back Baleful Strix and killing Snapcaster. It is tempting when your opponent only has one card left in hand to make them discard it as well. Oh wow, getting back Deathrite Shaman. Well, it's a reasonable line. It does set more of a clock than Baleful Strix. It looks like he's going to essentially just be staring with his Snapcaster at the opposing Snapcaster. He can crash in with it and just let them trade. Yeah, the one-mana Planeswalker from Return to Ravnica. Just going to stay on the board. Wow. Bombs away. Yup. Jace is just... One card in hand. He does have a fetch land out, so fate sealing isn't an automatic death sentence, but it's a, it's pretty close to that. Okay, Snapcaster's trade, making sure that there are no creatures on the board to attack this Jace. And this might just be a scoop from Josh. Yeah, I will say if if this goes much longer, you know, this is this is the type of trade off I was referencing before. You know, Josh does have a chance to win this game. It's just not very good. And whether or not that's going to be worth the time that he needs to win game two and three, that's going to be the real question. Right. Now he's, he's got a fetch land. So he, he's out, totally outgunned here with Deathrite Shamans. That Deathrite will never do anything worth doing as long as those other guys are on defense. Yeah, and the murderous cut to boot. lose two half of Josh's life points gone five more activations of death Rite shaman will win five more activations of jason mind sculptor will win yeah this is this is in my opinion past scoop territory and in every every draw that robert has here is just another nail in the coffin i mean another snapcaster that's it was already insurmountable and snapcaster just makes it that much more ridiculous Fate seal. You know, if, I, if I'm Robert here, I'm playing at a at a conservative pace, recognizing that I do not want to throw away a game that I can absolutely have won, and recognizing that the longer this goes, the worst case scenario is I get a draw in this match. Right. Uh, so this is this is really favoring Robert. Yeah, Josh. You know, uh, enjoying his camera time. Maybe thinks uh, he has an out here. Not sure what it would be. Maybe start with a Coligans returning Snapcaster kind of situation, but I'm not so sure. I think you're right. Yeah, let's see if Robert has access to green mana using something other than Deathrite Shaman. 
Yeah, they, they both have access to tropical islands, so mm. Death Right Shaman could have also eaten the Snapcaster in response to the Colgan's command. Right. It was really... And there we go, Josh, finally agreeing. With your assessment, he scoops him up, and he'll go to the sideboard. So when, when your back's against the wall uh, in this kind of grindy matchup, you sideboard differently, or is it just the same old type of sideboard cards, the efficient sideboard cards? Yeah, I don't tend to take into consideration winning uh, or losing game one. Uh, it's, it's kind of all must-win post-board. Uh, being on the player draw can be a consideration, uh, depending on the type of sideboard cards that you have. But if, as we take a look here, uh, so Josh has access to... Pyroblast, Surgical Extraction, Piving Needle, Fluster Storm, Thought Seize, Diabolic Edict, Invasive Surgery, Painful Truths, Fatal Push, and Toxic Deluge. Okay. And on the other side, we've got somewhat similar with Engineered Explosives, Pyroblast, Hydroblast, Diabolic Edict, Fluster Storm, Toxic Deluge, <laughs> Surgical Extraction, Piving Needle, uh, but then Blood Moon. The Blood Moon, okay. Uh, so on the, the Grixis Control side here with Robert, Blood Moon is a very interesting card. Uh, Josh does have the ability to play around it with basics. He also has Deathrite Shaman. It may or may not be the type of card that he wants to bring in. It's definitely going to pull, pull its weight in a deck like lands, where they, they just have, you know, most of the deck is lands, and their strategy <laughs> is based off of their activated abilities not of their lands. Not basic so much. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I'd imagine on Josh's side, the Painful Truths, maybe Fatal Push... A lot of the time what you'll see is people taking Force of Will out uh, because it is such a grindy matchup. Classic strategy, And you yep. really don't want to two-for-one yourself, and it's really not just the, the type of things that are worth Force of Willing. You know, like a, a Gurmag Angler, you're much more happy to just throw a Diabolic Edict at it than to just get a two-for-one. Right. Now, when I first started playing Legacy, I would have never thought that Force of Will would ever get sided out because it's just the kind of card that defines the format. And you don't side out the kind of cards that define the format. At least that's what I thought. But the more I played Legacy, the more I played the Blue Mirrors, the more I realized that I got to these draw-go situations where each player had very few resources, and I'd draw a Force of Will, and I would just be so sad. Yes. I'm not, I don't I don't want to exile a Brainstorm. I'd rather draw a Brainstorm than a Counterspell at that point in the game. Absolutely, yeah. Pyroblast is much stronger. Even though you look at these lists and they're not predominantly blue, Pyroblast is a much better card post sideboard. And Force of Willing a Brainstorm, Brainstorm still did its job. Right. Brainstorm is supposed to incrementally move you towards your goal. And when your opponent just went down a card, well, good enough. That's whereas, a him. Yeah, whereas Pyroblast, that is a great trade. They committed their mana. You, you actually set up your strategy a little bit and that you now have a target for your Snapcasters moving forward. Right, right. So it really does make a big difference when you're able to get some of the clunkier cards out which are there is insurance against really broken things nothing here is particularly broken the, the closest thing is like jace the mind sculptor is very broken and again pyroblast is sure. a much better answer to it uh, the only exception i guess is blood moon blood moon is potentially just game over yeah. uh, so that's that's the question there at the same time can can josh know that rob's bringing in blood moon I don't think he would be shocked. That okay. is a card that we do see, uh, but it is a big question. And we'll probably know right off the bat based off of how he manages his mana base. If he's grabbing basics, then he's totally onto the fact that Blood Moon is a possibility. Right. Now, if I'm Rob and I'm up again, and I'm not sure about the quality or about my opponent's thought process, if he's deep enough to think that I have Blood Moon, I'm not bringing in Blood Moon for game two when I'm up again. I'll, I'll leave that for game three. Uh, when I see how he's playing. That's kind of the luxury of being up a game, in my mind. Oh, I think that's a valid point. I think that does hedge a little bit. Um, you know, it, it does trade off the possibility of getting that free win mm -hmm. uh, with the possibility that your opponent is going to play around it, and then how strong is Blood Moon when they play around it? Because it still does create a lot of problems. Okay. Even if they are playing around it, it does make it so their Deathrite Shamans are pulling double duty, and when you're able to remove those, it can really set them back. I mean, he, he will never get to Jace the Mana, uh, Jace the Mind Sculptor Mana under a Blood Moon if you keep his Deathrites off the board. Like, sure. he just has a single basic island. So, turn one thought sees, uh, if you see a hand of uh, Gurmag, Deathrite, Kolagons, Pyro, what are you most afraid of? I mean, it, that's a snap death right. 
for sure. Uh, I, I just think you need to stop his mana development and stop whatever's on top of the deck. That's one of the things in Legacy that you really have to keep in mind is you know you can see their hand, know the coast is clear. You give them a draw step, things can change radically. Right. There's some powerful cards. Cards like Brainstorm, where all of a sudden they could have bricks in their hand and turn them into the three best cards in their deck. Uh, so the shields being down are, are good when you're playing a combo deck and you just want to win this turn. But the longer the game goes, the, the more likely things just spin back out of control. Sure. Now, he doesn't agree with you. He takes the Pyroblast. Uh, this speaks to me that he might have a death right answer. It could also be the fact that he has the Jace the Mind Sculptor in his hand and he's playing toward that. It is, in particular, with the hand the way that it is, Pyroblast it is a totally reasonable card to take there, seeing as how he may be moving all in on that Jace. Sure, sure. Jace, too good for Modern. We see here two cards that have been too good for Modern, the Death Rite and the Jace, and wow, he doesn't play his Death Rite. That is actually very interesting. I wonder if that's because he's concerned about an answer. Yeah, I mean, when your opponent thought seizes you and doesn't and doesn't take the Deathrite Shaman, you just have to figure they have an answer. And he thinks that if he draws Ponder and can sculpt his hand to play around an answer, then maybe that's a better line. We'll see if that's true. <laughs> this could be particularly disappointing if he if he does all of this and then tries to clear the way to find out <laughs> it's not actually what he wanted to be doing with the early game here. Right. But another death right is likely to be an answer to whatever his removal is. He just followed up with his brother. Are the other cards worth keeping? Mm. And he does have the fetch land, so... I like the way he's playing this. I mean, what... It's like when your opponent gives you so much information with their turn one play, thought sees not taking death right. You think they have another death right shaman. Reasonable. You keep the other death right shaman. Reasonable. So I like the way he's playing it. Whether or not it turns out that it's true, I think that the way he's he's uh, sculpted his game plan shows shows some forethought. A lot of card selection early. Shuffling away a couple of fetch lands. Gotta make sure you get your land first. And he is not worrying at all about Blood Moon at this point. He's fully committed to the non basic land plan. Yep, wants to deploy his Leovold. Wants to deploy his multicolored spells, and for those, he needs dual lands. Deathrite Shaman committed to board. There are answers in Rob's hand. He's got the Diabolic Edict. Colgan's Command. Going into the tank, thinking about how much of a problem that this Deathrite is right now. You know, his only mode here is making Josh also discard a card, which is potentially fine. He did just optimize his hand. They're likely all decent. So, uh, the fetch land crack speaks to that he might want to cast a two drop here. We'll see. It's not a him because that's not a black land. Vanilla Counterspell, a card that's kind of crept its way back into the metagame with the absence of Sensei's Divining Top and Miracles. Counterspell with Snapcaster is quite a bit to deal with for a dedicated combo deck. Try and show and tell, and they can just vanilla counter it is, uh, is a lot to deal with. Yeah. One of my favorite printings, the Mercadian Mass printing poking out there. Beautiful card. It really is. What's your um, what's your counter spell choice when you play it? It's actually masks. Yeah, I, I tend to not go hugely pimp with my cards. Uh, I at one point had a fully foiled out vintage deck. Oh all, boy! All uh, Guru Islands, foil misdirections, foil everything. Uh, this was back in the Miracle Grow era, and it was stolen out of my car. Oh, and I just, no. 
just kind of started playing with the, the less expensive versions after that. That's brutal. Did you ever figure out what happened to it? I'm pretty sure someone threw it in the trash. The, I had an iPod in the car, and this is shortly after they had come out, and uh, they just left it. So I'm pretty sure it was just some junkie grabbing my uh, bag that it was in. It looked like a laptop bag, so wow. they probably grabbed it, thought they were going to be able to pawn it for something, looked at it, saw it was a bunch of cardboard, and threw it in the trash. That would be, if I had to bet money, that would be what I'd guess. Ouch. Uh, but yeah, this definitely uh, sculpted my preference toward cards. I, I use unglued lands now, oh, typically. Oh, beautiful. Good uh, man. Good man. I also think they're a little less pretentious than, like, summer. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, they're yeah. just... Everybody can recognize it and be like, oh, that's cool art, and it's different. You know what I mean? So I hear the uh, Unstable is going to have text or borderless lands. Did you, oh, did you hear boy. this yet? No, they, no. They, full bleed, huh? Yeah, they went from full art to just no borders. Hmm. <laughs> Very fun. Well, I got to make people buy the unset somehow. Yeah, they've been unable to do it so far. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's been it's been a dog every time they release it. They they wait, you know, ten years or whatever, and then they're they give it another go. We'll see. It's got to be draftable. Like that's the thing. It's really tough to make it draftable. It's true. So here, getting back into the game, we see from Josh Snapcaster flashback Thoughtseize. Followed by Robert just casting Thoughtseize. So both players, not very many resources. Robert's trying to break it with a Coligans. Yep, this is a powerful part in the matchup. Just Guaranteed card. card advantage. Getting back Gurmag Angler. Just. Killing Snapcaster. I think instead it's making Josh discard a card, discarding Abrupt Decay. All right, I like it. I like it. I mean, the Snapcaster is not the biggest threat here. It doesn't look like Josh has any way of recurring it, so I do think that's strong. So here we go, two cards in hand versus two cards in hand. Let's see who comes out with the advantage. Josh needs to answer a 5-5 five five in the coming turns. Oh, double death right versus death right in Gurmag and death right. Wow. Wow, it's all able to come out here. As so many matches in Legacy come down to empty-handed, players just efficiently trade back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Yeah. And now, the cards that he chooses for Delve are going to be very interesting here. Josh is going to have kind of first crack at all of these instants and sorceries. Uh-huh. Interesting to note, too, Robert Russo has no Tropical Island in play, at least. So Deathrite cannot gain life currently unless the Green Man is produced by another Deathrite Shaman. Very interesting. He's leaving his instants and sorceries in there. Yeah, I don't which love is, it. Which is fuel for Josh. Right. One can repeat two players. Your scenes for the player are Yeah, so all instants and sorceries left. Four of them to be exact. So he's free to hit them now. One can repeat two players. Please find your sense. By tapping here, Robert will be free to hit them on his turn and back and forth. It really depends on the number of instants and sorceries total and when this Gurmag is going to be able to get through. We've got a chump blocker with Snapcaster potentially. Yeah, Josh needs a Gurmag of his own, uh, which actually, I'm wrong, he doesn't even play a Gurmag angler. Um, as In terms of answers in his deck, he has a couple edicts. He has couple edicts he has a couple edicts that might be it well he does have a tomb stalker okay tomb stalker is a 5-5 five, five flyer it's the original delver from back mm -hmm. in the future site and that could come down here uh, let's see here if josh takes the hit or not interesting you know four baleful stricks in josh's deck he could trade that's probably his best answer it does make it look like a big, dumb zombie fish. Yeah. <laughs> the little bait that's right in front of its mouth? Yeah, that's a Baleful Strix. All right, so Robert electing to keep his death rights untapped to try and counter any type of activation that Josh might have. Very tense situation here. Both players in the single digits. Both players with two death rights. This, these get really complicated, these board states. So many permutations. 
Josh does have a Singleton Lightning Bolt in the deck. That complicates things greatly. This has to favor the player. This has to not favor the player that blinks first, right? The player that blinks first in the death right war comes out below. Is that true? Well, it's going to depend on where the finish line is. If if Josh blinks during Robert's end step, Robert has to respond, letting Josh get a crack back on his turn. Ah. Of course, if the game continues from that point, then Josh's guys are now tapped down, and then Robert gets to get him back. So mm -hmm. you really got to get somebody close to that finish line, and then push him right over the edge. Right. So here, if Gurmag gets through, the game is essentially over, forcing the block. Right. And, and yeah, just Robert would have been free to activate his death rights. He wouldn't care that they'd get countered and then untap and then finish things off. So yeah, it is. It is very much about actually getting your opponent down to zero. <laughs> getting close <laughs> doesn't matter. A regular John Madden, you are Eric. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so death right is countered by death right from Robert. Which is okay, like you said, because Josh is about to untap. And Robert comes out on top in this war. There's this so much mana would be needed to really pull out of this. It would involve, you know, snap casters and lightning bolts and that vanilla counter spell likely just completely seals the deal. Yeah, as it turns out, Gurmag Angler is really hard to answer. Josh has access to fatal pushes and Colagons and Lightning Bolt and engineered explosives. But all of these come up short. My toughness and mana cost, it's turns out a vanilla five five for seven is hard to answer. I got a bunch of draft commons that could do it, but they're not in Legacy. Basic land. Going to be able to just... So right now, Robert is looking to tap down these Deathrite Shaman, getting rid of the blocker so his Garmag can come through. Mm-hmm. Fight over the same card here, and will death right. All right, so we're, we're looking at Robert going to seven. Crack in, and if he draws lightning bolt, that will be game. <laughs> this, is, this is not necessarily how I would have played it. This is very risky. Rob is giving Josh he, an he out really, He gave him out. He gave him out. He just needs the bolt or like a, a additional card drawing. So Ponder shuffles. He'll have one crack at it, one draw phase. What do you think it's going to be, Eric? I'm going to go with a Pyroblast oh, just because that feels the worst. That does feel the worst. One mana red spell, so close. Thought sees. I mean, that does have the ability to end the game. <laughs> Handshake. Handshake. Excellent, excellent job by Robert Russo. We may disagree with how he played it at the end, but at the same time, he doesn't know that Josh has lightning bolts. Um, but yeah, maybe could have played it a little tighter. Doesn't matter. The 1%, 2% chance from Josh doesn't come through. Robert Russo moves to 2-1. and one. Josh drops to 2-1. and one. Both still in contention to top 8 this Legacy Challenge. Both players having a good time with it. Legacy is one of those formats where it's hard to get mad when you lose because you have such a long-term view on Magic the Gathering if you've been playing Legacy a while. One of many tournaments. Absolutely, Josh is very likely to find his way back to the top eight here as well. He's a seasoned player, a lot of experience. On the other side of the table, 
I think attacking with the Gurmag mm -hmm. into the two active death rights either forces a chump block, okay. or if he just takes the five, then you can animate, uh, you can activate your death right shamans during his end step, or in response to him trying to go off there. Okay. So I think you actually just look to kill a death right shaman, and then at that point you've got a two to one death right shaman advantage. Take one more turn to win the game. Yeah. I, I think see. That's I think that's ideal. Um, because really, when you're activating your death rights during his end step, it's two to one. You're going to get through two points there, sure. and then you're going to get four more on your turn plus the angler. I mean, it's it was it was a a slight chance, uh, but I, I think maybe know, on the those, flip those side. Are, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say maybe on the flip side, he's worried about something like a Jace the Mind Sculptor. Is that a reasonable thing to be worried about? Could have been. Could have been. I'm not sure that that's really worse uh, if you attack and kill a death right if he jams a Jace the Mind Sculptor. And he's at one there. And he has to bounce Gurmag, of course. Yeah, I suppose you still end up dead there, so it looks like you're right that a tighter tighter line could have been used. Yeah, uh, in Jason, yeah, I mean, that, that actually does greatly complicate it. So, yeah, it's it really, there's so many different lines. A lot of the time you just have to gut check based off of experience and kind of feel where you want to go. He may have assumed that lightning bolt was boarded out because it oh. is a card that you can board out it's, right it doesn't kill everything that you want to be killing certainly doesn't kill uh your gurmag anglers it's not a great feeling to be killing baleful strips and snapcaster uh, but i think it's a great card just because of how death right shaman controls the matchup right. having one mana answers to death right are, are very very strong trading so. trading one mana for one mana pretty good trading two mana for one not so good as the edicts uh would do very interesting. If, if you ever who's just joining us, maybe just tuned into our Twitch stream, um, I'm Zach Hall and he's Eric Dupuy. We're coming to you live from Worcester, Mass. These fine gentlemen are playing Legacy. Some would argue it's the finest format in the game, uh, or at least one of them. Uh, but these gentlemen are playing for a chunk of change. First place is uh, about $650. That might be off by 25 there. But this is a $2,600 prize pool tournament um, with money going down to the top 16 places, which is... Uh, a pretty cool event on a Sunday. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's always, yeah. always great to see prize support for for the older formats. Yes. I love you know Vintage and Legacy, so thanks to TJ's and Tom Schaefer for putting on another great event and giving us uh, old Magic players yeah. a place to go and <laughs> sling some spells. Hey, I'm right there with you, man, right there with you. Uh, it's, now, these these tournaments are going to be every Sunday of the Titanium Plus weekends. Uh, the main event is always modern on, on Saturday with invitations to the Titanium Finals, while on Sunday we have more side events. Today there are two different PPTQs, as well as this Legacy Challenge. So either day, you I mean, we want you at both days, of course. Uh, you'll get on camera either day, but uh, if you can only come Sunday, there's still a lot to do. There's the PPTQs and everything that goes with them. Definitely, yeah. Uh, Gil tells us we're gonna be cut into a break. We're gonna uh, replay a match from previously in the weekend. Right. Um, give you and I a chance to do the necessary things. All right, go scout the room, see what's going to be on camera next. There we go. We're trying to get elves for you. We'll see if we can find a winning player. We'll see you soon, guys. Cool. They can't hear me. The, the mic uh, right now is set to be 